For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson with the latest readout video from our Wednesday Wake Up email newsletter, to which you should subscribe as well as watching the videos as avidly as the Brummies do. Which, if you aren't one, I maybe need to explain means people from Birmingham in the UK, who are 31st on our all-time city watch list. Also on our watch list, but in a different way, is how the usual suspects called Monday, July 22nd, 2024, the, quote, hottest day ever on Earth, end quote, smash so shattering the previous record for blistering death heat set on Sunday, July 21st. As Matthew Wilicki retorted indignantly, quote, We are currently still in an ice age, and for the vast majority of the last 550 million years, the planet was significantly warmer, end quote. So no, not the hottest day ever, even if we leave out, say, the Hadean Eon. And even considering only much more recent conditions, most people do not seem to be living through anything approaching record temperatures. Sure, the Earth is a big place, and someone somewhere is setting some kind of weather record every day, and would be even if the average temperature, rainfall, or anything else hadn't changed in 5,800 years. But really, things appear quite normal, even cool, in many parts of the world. Yet the media keep yelling stuff like, quote, world breaks hottest day record again despite El Nino's end, end quote. Seriously, what's going on? At least the Canadian press only called, quote, Sunday, then Monday, the hottest days humans have measured, according to the European Climate Service, end quote. But even so, it's rubbish. And the first reason why is that we're meant to believe it was exactly, precisely, 17.15 degrees Celsius globally on Monday. But nobody knows how warm it was to two decimal places anywhere, let alone everywhere, on that date, never mind in the past. Tell us how hot it was when Caesar was assassinated, to two decimal places, even just in the city of Rome, or just in the Forum. Bosh. Non potes dicimus. Hey there, just a quick reminder about subscriptions. We're this close to 100,000, so if you have already subscribed, thank you very much and enjoy the programs. If you haven't, click the button here, get us to 100,000 and beyond. And now, back to me. And another thing. Mathiness can be intimidating, but supposedly that figure is the daily average which means they must be claiming that they measured the precise temperature to two decimal places everywhere on land and at sea at every single second of that day. Phooey. And then there's this business about humans have measured. Measured how? The reason we have fairly confident assessments of the approximate temperature back when dinosaurs roamed the Earth is that we, uh, measured it using proxies we trust. Which is also how we know that it was warmer during the Holocene climatic optimum when civilization flourished and writing was invented than it is today or was on that Monday. Oh, measured by thermometers, you say? But Monday's pseudo-record wasn't measured by thermometers. Instead, it was, quote, provisional satellite data, end quote, that most ironclad of statistically absurd guesses dating back to 1979. Besides, you could believe satellite measurements are a lot more exact than they are without falling for the notion that, quote, Monday was 0 0.06 degrees Celsius, 0 0.1 degree Fahrenheit, hotter than Sunday, end quote, worldwide. Because again, nobody, including the European Copernicus Agency that made this measurement, knows what the temperature is anywhere to 0 0.06 degrees Celsius, let alone what it is everywhere. You couldn't even measure it in your living room with that degree of precision. And another thing, if it's hotter than the hottest thing ever, everywhere on Earth, why isn't it hotter anywhere on Earth? The United States has the best long-term thermometer readings anywhere outside the Central England temperature data set, and a famous map of the U.S. by Chris Martz, using NOAA data, shows that the vast majority of states set their all-time records back in the 1930s, and only three have done so in this century. Before the authorities tampered with the data, we mean. Apparently, the key to the whole panic is that it was 6 to 10 degrees Celsius warmer than normal in Antarctica. And how do they measure the temperature there to two decimal places? Well, it's only 14.2 million square kilometers, or 5.5 million square miles, nearly half again as big as Europe, and it contains fully 137 weather stations. So, Bob's your double decimal. 
or they made it up. Also, as those of you with long memories by climate alarmist standards will recall, Canada's unusually harsh wildfire season in 2023 was touted as proof of global warming. The quiet American one was ignored, as it might have raised awkward questions about what different planet the U.S. was on. But now Canada is again burning, or so people keep saying. But, at the risk of spoiling the fun with evidence yet again, we feel constrained to point out that, as of late July, there were nearly a thousand fires burning in Canada, which is perfectly normal. That one particular fire devastated the historic scenic town of Jasper, in the imaginatively named Jasper National Park, is certainly regrettable. But blaming it on climate change or global heating is exploitative, especially given all the warnings to federal authorities that poor forest management in the face of a mountain pine beetle infestation was creating ideal conditions for exactly such a disastrous blaze, which now also looms over the even more iconic Alberta mountain resort town of Banff. But the main point is, Canada is big, it's rugged, it's often remote, and it has very many trees. So there have been what used to be called forest fires here since the invention of the tree. So, if 2024 turns out to be a normal year for Canadian wildfires, or a quiet one, will it have any bearing on what 2023 did or did not prove? Or will they just start yelling that Canada's 2025 fire season will finally prove that we are all going to die a fiery death? Ah, and here's a classic climate, one rule for thee, another for me example. After some Just Stop Oil activists got jail time for blocking public roads and obstructing people's access to things like critical medical appointments, two writers in The Guardian said, quote, let's stop locking up our truth-tellers, end quote. Yet one of the writers, Dale Vince, quote, has multiple times called for the incarceration of climate deniers, end quote. Now that's ugly. Also, inquiring minds at the New York Times want to know, quote, can Harris finish Biden's climate agenda, end quote. No. Next question. Oh dear, it's what is Vampire Summer from National Geographic? And the answer here is, quote, researchers say the rising summer heat is keeping us indoors more days, end quote. Actually, it was a lot hotter in the U.S. in the 1930s, and back then almost nobody had air conditioning, which is what's really keeping people indoors, not to mention giant screen TVs and hypnotic video games. But go ahead, blame climate change. And they do. Meanwhile, something called Clean Energy Canada, predictably located on unceded traditional territories and paid by government to nag government, just said, quote, Today's launch of the federal government's Canada Green Building Strategy shows a clear understanding of the key priorities needed to help affordability-constrained Canadians and our changing climate. In some areas, however, it also lacks an implementation plan to meet the moment, end quote. Gosh, an implementation plan? Do you need those? Are they a key priority? Well, if not, you might get this story out of Australia. Quote, Households yet again face the prospect of even higher electricity bills after the cost of power jumped more than 20% in the last quarter on the back of a renewable energy shortage and coal-fired power station outages. End quote. Just saying. In the newsletter, we also note that an important difference between climate science and the normal kind is that in climate science, failed predictions don't diminish people's faith in a theory. For instance, on hurricanes. The 2023 season was meant to be nasty, but it fizzled out. So, they predicted horrors for 2024 as well. And it's proving a dud too, so we're told, quote, here's when hurricane activity is expected to return, end quote. And if it doesn't, well, you just wait for 2025. Or 2026, because uh, we're bound to get lucky someday. As in, unlucky, but everything is upside down in the wacky world of climate alarmism. Also, a recent piece, quote, It's Later Than You Think, Climate Fueled Extreme Weather Part 3, end quote, by Roger Pilkey Jr., addresses the somewhat recondite mathematical point that if the weather is becoming more unusual, we might not notice it at first. That's because it's naturally variable anyway. Now, there are established statistical methods of looking at how unusual the weather has to get, and for how long, in order to detect a meaningful change in typical conditions, rather than just the usual random incidents of wet or dry, calm or windy, 
hot or cold and so on, that have made weather forecasting the butt of jokes beyond number. However, when you're looking for trends and things that fluctuate naturally, it turns out that it can take centuries rather than decades, years, or just months to confirm that the weather has gotten worse, or for that matter, better. So, once again, even if we wish we knew, even if we really need to know, we can't. And making stuff up is no substitute for knowing it. In the newsletter, we also repeat again Jay Budzichewski's democracy-sustaining claim that people are logical, though slowly. Because as the Green New Deal turns from distant, shimmering vision to mirage luring politicians into the valley of energy death, the city of Vancouver abruptly dumped its ban on natural gas heating and cooling systems in new homes because it was a hugely expensive pain in the furnace. And even climate alarmists seem to be rethinking their opposition to nuclear power, and even the Canadian government is starting to realize, and even discuss publicly, how solar panels create a, quote, significant pollution risk, end quote, when it's time to dispose of them. And more realism in a debate is always a good thing. Including because of that offshore wind pollution disaster in Martha's Vineyard, on which even Heatmap admitted, quote, this is the worst possible moment for an offshore wind debacle. Vineyard wind has given offshore opponents some powerful new ammunition, end quote. Now, they went on to claim that, quote, major errors like blade failures are incredibly rare, end quote, but actually, since it's a new and subsidized technology, we have no idea whether they are or not, but we certainly should be paying attention to it. The Wall Street Journal editorialized snidely that, quote, there is no such thing as clean energy as the liberal gentry on Nantucket are learning after an offshore wind turbine blade snapped and littered beaches with debris. Somehow the uproar among progressives is more muted than after an oil spill or train derailment, end quote. Yes, it is. But still, they are discussing it, and that's progress for progressives, even if we're not out of the windmills yet. In the newsletter this week, we also continue our cheerful chart series with a look at global per capita CO2 emissions. And even skeptics should care about them because, in the first place, climate is complicated, so despite our view here at CDN that the problems are overstated and the models are alarmist, it makes sense not to mess around with nature if we don't have to. The other reason is that there is a robust statistical correlation between rising atmospheric CO2 and panicky politicians promoting disastrous climate policies that we need to try to stop. And fortunately, this week's cheerful chart shows that global per capita CO2 emissions have stopped rising and seem to be drifting downward, which means the IPCC's emission scenarios are hopelessly overstated and can be safely ignored, along with their apocalyptic forecasts of the impacts of CO2. And another thing. One surprising aspect of climate science, perhaps more surprising to alarmists than anyone else, is that CO2 on its own doesn't do a lot of warming in climate models. Instead, it causes a bit of warming that supposedly causes extra water vapor to accumulate in the air, and that in turn is meant to cause a lot of heating. That really is what the models say, the alarmist models. But, basic data question, how do we know that extra water vapor should accumulate in the atmosphere? How do we know if it is? Well, it's the usual simple physics. You see, the clausius clapeyron rule says that for every degree warmer the air gets, its potential humidity rises by about 7%. And climate models predict that the air's water vapor content, that's the specific humidity, should rise in step with its potential humidity, meaning that its relative humidity remains constant. But a recent study shows that, especially over the arid and semi-arid regions of the Earth, it's not happening. So, again, the simple physics isn't so simple after all, and, again, it's not as bad as the settled science claimed. Finally, from the CO2Science.org archive, radishes to you, Jack. Well, apparently some people like them in a summer salad, and in climate science research. They've done dozens of studies, and the studies have confirmed that, yes, adding 300 parts per million of CO2 to the atmosphere makes radishes about two-thirds bigger, and an extra 600 parts per million bulks them up by four-fifths. So, when the climate apocalypse hits, we'll still have radishes. Yum yum. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and I can't even measure my own body temperature to two decimal places. <laughs>